Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Thursday live stream. I'm going to do something that I usually do not do, which is not really a smart decision. I'm going to be talking about politics because over the last 24 hours, it just seems like it's the elephant in the room. So I have to talk about what's going on. And before we talk about this issue, let me just uh, be crystal clear. This channel isn't financial advice and it's definitely not voting advice. I'm just telling you what is going on. It is up to you to do your own research as to what candidate you would like to vote for. And there's a there's three of them essentially. Uh, you've got Biden, you got Trump, and you got RFK Jr. So it's not like this, you have to go in a certain direction. I'm just telling you what's happening behind the scenes. So today, if uh, you missed it, uh, we had a great, uh, had a good show with uh, me, Ben, Nick from Coin Bureau, and we went over on the NFA uh, live over on Ben's channel. Real good stuff, mostly about uh, macro, uh, the different narratives in 2025, and then also, of course, talking about minivans. So you can check that out. There's a link in the description. So here's where everything devolves and comes into. So this was a post from yesterday. This is over the last 24 hours. And this is from Bitcoin Magazine, legislation that would overturn the SEC rule. This is for, this is resolution 109. It would overturn SEC rule preventing highly regulated financial firms from custodying Bitcoin and crypto passes the house. Now, if you're not from America, just know that just because it passes the House of Representatives as a bill, which is actually kind of rare, it has to go into the Senate, and the Senate actually has to approve it. And if the Senate approves it, it goes to the President of the United States, and the President can say, okay, we're going to go through this, or he's going to veto it. And uh, this, of course, would allow institutions and banks to custody Bitcoin and digital assets, which is what they were asking for when this Bitcoin ETF came about. And they're like, look, we need this because places like Coinbase, other places, we would like to custody these, these digital assets. Allow us to do that. So they repealed it. And then there was a statement that came out. This is from the executive office of the president of the United States. And he says, look, the administration strongly opposes passage of HA Resolution 109, which would disrupt the SEC's work. And that's, that's kind of a stretch to say work. To protect investors in crypto asset markets and to safeguard the broader financial systems. To safeguard the broader financial systems, I can understand where they're going here as far as like banks, but to, to protect us, I don't know how much protection we possibly need. I feel pretty good so far. I think I can understand these things. I'm not an ignoramus. But uh, this, is the, I mean, this is the administration's policy. Like, look, if this, since this goes through, if it comes to this, this desk, we're going to veto it. So sorry for all that work. And again, not telling you who to vote for. I'm just saying. And this is really what it comes down to. This is why I put uh, Charles, that beautiful picture, Charles with his head blowing up essentially, and what he said in his recent uh, video, which I linked in the description, you can check that out. I want you to be able to hear this. And it's uh, about 10, 20 minutes long, but uh, we're just gonna go over the 16 seconds. So this is the crux of what he pretty much said. And I gotta agree with him. So just take a listen and uh, we'll go from there. I don't really care who you vote for, whether it be RFK or Trump or somebody else. I don't really care who you vote for, whether it be RFK or Trump or somebody else, but do understand a vote for Biden is a vote against cryptocurrencies. A vote for Biden is the, a vote against the American cryptocurrency industry. That's it. That's all he said. I mean, he went into why that is, and he went into about, again, I don't care who you vote for. Me personally, I live in Puerto Rico, so I can't vote for president anyhow. I'm just telling you, this is what is happening. And a vote over here, potentially, it could be a vote against crypto and digital assets. And of course, people will say, well, I absolutely despise the other candidate. You got two other ones you want to pick from, right? If you want to go for RFK Jr., he seems to be pretty pro crypto, and there's some different policies that uh, may entice you. And then, of course, the other side of Trump, people absolutely either they love him or they hate him. I'm just saying, telling you, this is what is going on. And then to dig deeper into this, but people say, well, Rob, what? You know, Trump has come out, you know, he came out three years ago and said that uh, Bitcoin was essentially a scam and didn't like it and everything else. First of all, that was three years ago. As a reminder, Michael Saylor in 2013, Michael Saylor, the biggest Bitcoin bull out there, said essentially that it was Bitcoin's time to expire and go away. He was not a fan of Bitcoin. How long did it take him? It took him quite a bit of time, actually. 
until 2020, essentially to get on board. And now, of course, he is the biggest Bitcoin bull. So don't you don't say that, oh, because somebody thought this one thing before, that's what they're thinking right now. And then the other argument would be, well, he's just a politician, and he's a liar. Well, no kidding. They're all liars. <laughs> I like I, I I don't know like what else to say. They're all liars. So I mean that's usually what it comes down to. But I mean, he did at least pivot and say, like, look, well, let me see have you listen to this. Thank you for the statement. Yeah, with the goggles on. Uh, a, a lot of the smartest people in crypto are moving their businesses out of the U.S. because they're scared of, like, uh, the U.S.'s regulations. Because of the hostility. Correct. Yeah, crypto is moving out of the U.S. because of hostility toward crypto. Correct. So what are you going to do to stop it? Well, we'll stop it because I don't want that. I don't want that. I want that. If we're going to embrace it, we have to let them be here. Yes, sir. Okay, so that's what he says right there. Is he going to do it? Who knows? He wants the vote, though why wouldn't he do it? I'm just saying. It makes a lot of sense. And then this is another uh, piece. This is from uh, my man Dan Gambardello. And uh, this is another uh, angle for what he actually talked about. Here you go. They are against it. The Biden, uh, Biden doesn't even know what it is. If you ask Biden, <laughs> sir, are you for or against crypto? What's that? What the? Get me off the stage. <laughs> you say, get me off the stage. No, he has no idea, but look, Gensler is very much against it. The Democrats are very much against it. And I say this, uh, a lot of people are very much for it. Probably a lot of the people in this group. Yeah, so I mean, that's it. And then of course this came out, but there's a flip side to everything, right? I can't just give you this one side and not tell you the flip. And the flip side is Anthony Scaramucci. If there is anybody out there who is not a fan of Donald Trump, it would be Anthony Scaramucci. Let me bring this up so you can actually see it. And uh, this would be right here. And the Mooch said it very wisely. He goes, I'm not sure why the Biden administration wants this self-inflicted wound. I can't figure that out either. Can someone explain why they are ceding this ground to Trump? There is a lot at stake here, and single-issue voters could decide the election. Now, that may be true. And of course, it's up to you to decide, like, is this somebody for me if you are, you know, a U.S. citizen and can actually vote in this presidential election? People say, well, what about January 6th? And what about the uh, uh, NATO congregation? What about what's going on? And what about the increase in taxes on, on the other side? Look, I'm not here to sway anybody's opinion. I'm just telling you, these are the facts. And I don't see Biden pivoting anytime soon and definitely not Gary Gensler. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments section. I'm pretty sure that will be a hot topic, but let's move on, shall we? Because time is ticking. And time is ticking, and I kind of just was, we were talking about this today on NFA Live about what is the next catalyst? What is the next catalyst that pushes us forward? And there's a great website called 99bitcoins.com, and we, we talked about narratives. And of course, we just got past the halving. We had a nice big push. I think Bitcoin hit around 73,000. Altcoin market is up. I think we're at 2.4 trillion now. Bitcoin could be at 62, probably dropping a little bit more. But I was taking a look at all these things about what could be the next catalyst. And this is going back into the beginning of 2020, before coronavirus. And, uh, you know, we were going into the halving itself. Looks like there was, a, there was positive things, like India Supreme Court lifts the ban on Bitcoin. And, of course, the coronavirus came in. Bitcoin loses half its value in the two-day purge. And as we get into, I think it was around May 12th, correct me in the comment section, of when we actually had the halving in 2020. Third Bitcoin app, yeah, somewhere around there. Bitcoin miners in China ordered to shut down on May 25th. 91 million from Russia, Bitcoin exchange extorted. Researchers exposed flaw in Bitcoin wallets. It's pretty negative. And that's why we kind of went sideways, like maybe. Twitter accounts hacked. But then we get some uh, good news. Look at this one back in, what the heck? July 2020. U.S. regulator greenlights banks for cryptocurrency custody services. They must overturn that. MicroStrategy buys 21,000 Bitcoin. Okay, now that's a positive one. U.S. seizes Bitcoin. Happens all the time. Someone lost 16 million in Bitcoin. KuCoin exchange hacked. Of course, you can see as things go down. But the narratives were looking pretty good. OKX suspends. Then PayPal allows Bitcoin and crypto spending. And we had Tesla actually accepting Bitcoin. And it was all these narratives that looked pretty good. But out of all these different things that happened, I think the biggest thing that actually happened, and this is what I'm, we're always talking about, liquidity. And it really comes down to the macro factors. This is the M2 money supply. What do you notice? This is going back to 2018. And what I overlay here is on the uh, blue, the blue line. 
that is the uh, in the total market cap for cryptocurrencies in digital assets, including Bitcoin. And you can see as the uh, money supply increases, as the uh, Fed and the Treasury turn on their printers, what do we see? We see, well, first of all, back in 2020, quite a bit of a drop. And what happened? Printer goes burr, and what happens? Exponential volume goes up and goes up. So all the good things that we have, maybe it's just as simple as that, as it's just excess liquidity in the market. And as we kind of go sideways, we have a little bit of a drop off. And then, of course, as it decreases, so does the price of the total market cap. But one thing to note here, though, is that as we've gone sideways, we have still have gone up. So it is interesting that there is actual liquidity, but I still think the macro factors are a big piece. And I'll leave it off with this. Ben just put this out. The Atlanta Fed is now projecting that the Q2 of 2024, real GDP to be 44.2%, which I found fascinating because... Q1, we were at 3.3%, meaning that our economy is growing at a nice click. And I found this interesting that the Atlanta Fed is, this is the projection coming out. So there is no, it looks like there is no visibility of any recession. Everything is growing. GDP is, is, is off the races. Looks fantastic. And it's amazing that it's in a presidential election year. But I want to direct you to this video. This is from George Gannon, rebel capitalist. He talks about Warren Buffett is now the bearish he's ever been. And he takes a look at a lot of macro factors in this video. And it's very short, like 17 minutes. I linked that in the description. And I want you to make the judgment call for yourself to see if we are in the right place at the right time with the macro events. To me, I don't, I'm just gonna leave it up to you. And that's it for today. I've, I've done enough assumptions. We'll just go that way. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talked about is time sensitive.